<laughs> I did not win it. <laughs> okay, so so how about how about a uh, question like this? Uh, this is a really simple question, but you have to be able to interpret what they're saying. So find the number whose square whose square root most exceeds its square. There's only one number? Yeah, find the one number. We're going we're to find, it's kind of a weird thing to do, we're going to find the one number whose square root most exceeds its square. One that has to be less than one. It is. You're right. But the math guys will tell us that. If we just set it up right, they'll tell us. Uh, how do I do that though? So that's a weird thing. I want to find the number whose square root most exceeds its square. So this is giving us the recipe for some function, right? So if the number is x, right? Yeah, so f of x is going to be what? Square root of x? But it, the, the most exceeds. So what would I do then? Like, like, how much does 10 exceed 5 by? How much does 10 exceed 3 by? How'd you get this? Subtracting. Okay, so if the number whose square root most exceeds its square, I'm trying to minus, minus x squared. Okay, the right idea. Right. Most exceeds its square. So we want to know for what number is the, the function, the square root of x minus the x squared, going to be the greatest? Okay. Uh, what's our domain going to be for this? Uh, can't be negative, right? Because, yeah, exactly, we have a square root there. So it's just going to be anything greater than zero. There's no real constraint on that, though, right? Okay, and then we just do some math, right? This is one where it's pretty easy to set this thing up. Now we just have to take a derivative, and we'll decide if we want to take a second derivative. What's our derivative function? 1 half x to the negative 1 half, so we could just make that 1 over 2 radical x, yeah. right? Minus 2x, good. Uh, I don't know, do we, I don't really want to do a second derivative on that one. Do you? I mean, we can, I don't feel like it. We can just do first derivative test, how about it's not right? it's not Yeah, let's not. So then we can do a little bit of horizontal math here. Let's scoot over and let's just answer the question, when does f prime equal 0, right? So f prime is undefined at zero, but zero is not going to be a good answer, is it? Right, that's clear. We don't even need to worry about that. Square root of zero, I get, I get zero. Well, that's not very much. It's not exceeding it at all. So f prime equals zero when, if I set that equal to zero, that term equals that term, right? So when one over two radical x equals two x, we just have to solve that equation. So what do we do? So, right, I mean, I could, and I could just think about like maybe cross multiplying. I've got a, a proportion there, a ratio equation. So if I just multiply straight across, I get 4. What's x to the 1 half times x to the 1? x to the 3 halves equals 1. Okay, now how do I solve for x? Divide by 4. That way. To the two thirds. To the two thirds. Okay. So if I do x, and I'm going to change colors here because anytime I take both sides to a power, I got to check my answer and see if it actually works. Right. So we get x equals one fourth to the two thirds. The two thirds. Okay, so what is one fourth to two thirds? I mean, we can we can turn that into some kind of a radical. Why don't we just make it? Well, we'll figure out exactly what it is. So it's going to be. Square root of four. So it's going to be let, let's do the squared part first. One fourth squared is going to be one sixteenth, right? And that's going to be the cube root of one sixteenth, which is just one over the cube root of sixteen, and. What's cube root of 16? So that's like 2 cube root of 2. Cube root of 8 times cube root of 2. Good enough. We're not going to rationalize that. It's fine. That's, that's just a number. Okay. That's the only number that satisfies 
That's the well, no, that's the only critical number we get. Right? Any number you guys have already you're smart, you've already thought about this. You already realized that numbers less than one, yeah, I can tell you guys, I can people are already thinking that. Numbers less than one are the only numbers where you're gonna get a positive result from this, right? But that's the one number that's less than one that's gonna give you the biggest problem. We've got to make sure we'll put it in the table and see. But when we throw that into a table, let's see what happens. So we're going from zero to infinity, or one critical number was one over two cubed root two. What is that as a decimal? Real quick, do we have that? 0.397. About 0.397. Okay. And that was a zero for the first derivative. So then if we wanted to, let's just use the first derivative test rather than go through the hassle of finding a second derivative. So what could my test numbers be? What could my test points be for the first derivative? One would be a good one. So if we pick one, the sign of the first derivative at one is going to be, I'm going to get what, one half minus two? So negative. Okay. How about another one? Zero. Um, I can't do oh, zero, right? Okay. But I could do something like um, one, two, five. Yeah, what about one fourth? That might be a good one, right? If I do one fourth, what's the square root of one fourth? One half. One half. So two times one half is going to be one minus two times one fourth is one half. So one minus one half. Positive. Okay, so what's that tell us then? If we've got a horizontal tangent, I have a zero first derivative, so I have a horizontal tangent, and look what my first derivative test tells me. I go from increasing to decreasing, so there's my maximum, right? Okay, now let me show you how you can get this, how you can legally cheat on this, right? And you're going to do this a lot in college. So we haven't really talked a lot about this, but if we use a graphing utility, just watch what happens if we use Desmos. We already did the hard work of coming up with, and this is most of the work here in a lot of cases, is coming up with that function. But if I just graph this function, okay, there's my function, f of x equals square root x minus x. Square. Oops. Not x2, x squared. And it looks like we want to just be down there, doesn't it? So if I zoom in, look what Desmos does. It's kind of nice. If I click on the function, there's there's the maximum right there. Okay? And just like you predicted, only between 0 and 1 is it positive. Okay? So that's our answer. You can check your work on all these if you want to. Yes, sir? Where did the that function derive it? Uh, differentiate it? No, you don't. You don't. I mean, you can, in Desmos, if you're just trying to find the maximum, you can do this one graphically. You can just look at the graph of our, of our primary equation, right, and see that that's going to be the peak. Is it just after that it just goes down forever, right? And we and we can predictably, you already have determined that once it's bigger than one, obviously it's just going to get more and more negative. Is that is that your question? Well, I thought you put derivatives. You you can, you can. So we can do this now. We could do something like let's call it g of x equals f prime of x. And and what do you notice about this? Yeah, we did look at this before. So there's that's the same x value, isn't it? But that's just where we find the derivative transitions from positive to negative, which corresponds to that peak, doesn't it? Right? Okay? On your graphing calculators, I want to show this to you on there also. So on your TI-84s, and you might want to just, you know, we haven't done a lot of this yet, but this, once again, this is a big college thing. It's helpful, really helpful. Uh, no, we don't have to do matrices. How do I just make this thing? What the heck? Where 
change this. Okay, so on your calculators, there's, a, there's some ways you can do this that are pretty cool. So on your calculators, you can go into the Y equals menu, and we can do the same thing. It, it's a little more cumbersome than it is on, on Desmos, but it works really well. So F of X would be Y1. So that's square root X minus X squared. So there's my function. Now, when I go on my, you might remember this from Algebra 2. When we do, we want to set up the window on this, right? So what's our domain going to be? Well, we're just going to let X, we don't need negative values. We can just go from 0 up to, who knows? Well, you guys already told me that you know one's going to be the biggest. So what if we just go to 1? We set the X's, and then do you remember what we do? Rather than trying to set the Y's manually, what do we always do? Zoom fit. So zoom 6. Or, sorry, zoom 0. Zoom, I forgot. I'm dead somewhere. Zoom 0. There it is. And then now if we want to find the maximum, it's a, like I say, it's a little more cumbersome. We've got to go second calc maximum. So number 4. And then we have to just set a left boundary. So you can either type in a number manually or just kind of trace over there. So there's a point to the left of the maximum, point to the right of the maximum. And then a guess, so some place in the middle. And it tells, so we get the same answer, don't we? Right? So either way. Okay? Um, I can't remember as long as I've done this, but I want to see real quick. Um, no, those are really our only. Oh, that one. We can do this one too. So you can also go. We can just go back to the home screen. So quit, get out of there. I haven't done this in forever. But if we do function max, we do 7. And then we can type in, we just have to give it the same kind of information we gave the graph. So I'm going to put in the function. So I can do square root of x. Oops, square root of x. Minus... x squared, and then you have to do comma, you have to, we call these arguments in program. You've got to feed it all the information it needs, so you tell it the function, comma, the variable, and then you got to give it some boundaries. So like if we went between 0 and 1, I think this is going to work. Yeah, it also, you can do it that way too, if you don't want to graph it. Okay, but the graphing way is probably easier to do. Okay. Next problem. So what about this one? What two numbers whose product is 41 have the smallest possible sum? Bye. See ya. Good luck. Thanks. So the next y equals 41. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the numbers are x and y, right? Okay, so that, that's our equation of constraint. If we want the smallest sum, what's going to be our primary equation? X plus y. X plus y, right? So call it s for sum. And now we need a constraint, right? If there's no constraints, we want the largest possible or smallest possible sum will make them both zero, right? But there is a constraint. The product is 41, right? So we know xy equals 41. Take your pick. Solve for y, I guess, right? If you solve for y, y equals 41 over x. Plug that in there, okay? Do you think... Real quick, do you, th well, I might ask, we'll just, we'll just keep going. So if I plug that in, then I get S equals X plus 41 over X, but now I want to call it S of X, because it's a function of a single variable, right? And now we're just into calculus. Um, what is my domain here? Say it again. X can't equal zero. You're right. Good. Okay. Okay. And let's say, okay, I should have made this. So what does smallest mean? 
let's say they have to be positive numbers. I probably should have said what two positive numbers are. Right, so, so now instead of x is not equaling zero, we'll change, oops, we'll change that to x is greater than zero. Okay? And then we would just do another problem like that, right? And now we don't even probably even have to do it. We set it up. If we want to do this on Desmos, we can already find out what our answer is going to be. So we'll just change this to x minus 41 over x. X plus 41. Oops. Okay. And if I'm trying to find they have the smallest possible sum, well, what do you know? There's so for my domain, for values bigger than zero, what's one of the numbers is 6.403, right? Uh, so on the test, I'm going to ask you to give me exact answers, right? So you, you'd have to, I mean, you can check your answer that way, okay? But you still have to do the work. So we would have to just do the calculus and, and figure out what the critical number is and, you know, show that it's a, it's a minimum. But that part's not so hard. You've done lots of problems like that, right? Questions? Once again, you know the answer, though. You know, I mean, you just go until you get it right. Okay. Okay, I like this one. This is a good one. So I, I you know, I'm getting getting tired of teaching. You guys are getting tired of learning probably by the end of the year. Let's just bunch it and make clams out. What do you say? Well, I just got back from the report, so this is fun. Oh, yeah? Indeed. There you go. I have those. So we want to sell clam chowder in cans, and we already know that the ideal portion, we've done the calculus, and the ideal portion size is 128 cubic centimeters. I'm going to make this a little bit easier. I'll tell you what, I'm going to change it slightly. Let's make it, I'm going to make it 128 pi cubic centimeters, just to make the calculations a little bit easier. 128 pi. We've already figured it out. That's, we optimized people's, that's a really good story. It is. I have a pretty good family size. Okay. Family size. Family, size. Yeah. Uh, families love clam chowder. So that, that's our that's our size. What we want to contain. What dimensions are going to minimize the amount of tin use? We're making tin cans here, right? We're environmentally conscientious here. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing. So we got to do a little calculus and figure out how's that going to work. So surface area. Of uh, cylinder. Okay, surface area of a cylinder, right? This is just going to be just a right circular cylinder. We've got a radius, R, height H, right? And we know that surface area of a cylinder is what? Two times the area of circle. Okay, so we get the top and bottom. So there's two circles, 2 pi R squared. Plus. You, mean, you mean plus? Plus, yeah. Plus the, now how, how about the, what's the lateral area of that? The circumference. Circumference, there you go. So 2 pi r. 2 pi r h. Okay. Good enough. we got two variables though. So what's our constraint going to come from? Volume. Uh, there's our volume, right? So pi r squared h. Okay, so now volume of a right circular cylinder is just going to be the surface area of the bottom times the height. So we're just going to extrude that through space to carve out space, right? Carve out volume. So pi r squared h equals 128 pi. Okay, so. Yeah, you know what? It would have been probably better than that. <laughs> Smarter than myself. That was would have been better without it. Would have been. All right. Um, okay, so we'll do it this way. So then, which one are we going to solve for? H, right? We're going to solve for H because one H in each equation, right? So we solve for H. We get H equals. 128 pi over pi 
R squared, so we know the pi's cancel. Okay. 128 over R squared. We can make our substitution, and then we end up with surface area. equals 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r times that, right? First r is out. Okay, and so we could, yeah, we could do some stuff. We could cancel, cancel that, simplify things a little bit. So s of r equals 2 pi r squared plus 256 pi over r. Okay, got it down to one variable. What's our domain going to be then? If we look at this thing. So I mean if, you know, we can approach zero. Zero would, zero would make a lot of sense. What's our maximum going to be? Well, we've got a certain amount of volume there. So theoretically, if we squish that volume out, infinitely thin, it's going to go out infinitely wide, right? Okay, so zero to infinity. And now we just got to do some calculus. You guys can do the calculus. Right? That's not too bad. We get, this is not a bad equation to differentiate. There's no radicals in it, right? So I just get a negative exponent, positive exponent. No big deal. We could legally cheat, though. Oh, yeah. In your math careers? For sure. This year? Not so much. I'm just going to call this f of x. So 2 pi r squared. Oops, x squared. Plus 256 pi divided by r. X. Oops, x. Okay. And what do we get? I got to zoom way out of this thing. And if I look up here, there's the part of the function I'm interested in. So let's go ahead and on Desmos, remember on if you want to get this thing to look better, it's hard to by zooming in and out, you're just zooming both axes at the same time. But we can always go up to the wrench, and we can control the precisely control what the domain and the range are going to be in the window. So x, why don't we just go from 0 up to what's our radius going to be? I mean, probably, I don't know, like start with 20 or something. And then the y, oops. There we go. That's better. And there we can see it well enough already. Right? Okay, so 4. Right? So 4 is the, that's the value, the radius that's going to minimize surface area. Okay? What is the surface area? 96 pi. 96 pi. Right? Okay? And then the calculus will tell us that if we do the calculus. Why is it it gives an exact answer for that, but not for radicals? Uh, well, that just happened that we didn't get a radical. The exact answer was just 4. No, I mean the um, 96 pi. Oh. Um, Why does it give an exact answer there, but not for a radical? I'm not sure. Just that it would be the probably a lot easier to do with pi. Probably, I mean, for one thing, I had pi's in my answer, so it's already, it's just like a coefficient. Probably a lot easier to calculate. The algorithm makes it easier to calculate that way. Okay, and then we don't probably need to do this one. Yeah, we don't probably need to do that one. If we have time, we can. Uh, the other one I would look at, though, I'll give you a little helpful hint. So for the test, I would look at the one, remember we did one in class where, and I think you guys maybe did one of these, on the assignment, I think, on the assignments. Look at the one where there was a, remember we built the pill shape thing, right? We 
built the, the cylinder with hemispherical end caps where the end caps were more expensive to produce than the barrel. That would be a good one to, good one to look at. It would give you something that's where there's a cost associated with it. I'll tell you that much. Yep. Four points of your point. Take a couple more points. I'll have it available tomorrow. Okay. You, you want to take, I don't get, you'd rather start, what day do you guys want to test this week? I don't care, I'm just going to start new stuff if we don't test tomorrow. So it's your call. What's a good day for people to be here on, on a week, uh, on a spring day? Yeah. Yeah. It's probably true. You guys, what's a good day? I don't care. I don't, I don't care what you do tomorrow. Well, it's not tomorrow's, I don't care. You don't have to. If you guys have another test, I mean, it's, you know, I don't want to walk you down the test. What, what's the vote? What do you think? Thursday? Thursday? Are good? Okay. On Thursday? Or for us. That's tomorrow. Just, just do two tests. Do one step. <laughs> well, I probably won't do that. But I'll probably get, if you want to just do it tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Thursday. We'll be here. Oh my gosh, where are the going? Where's Thursday and Friday? Where are you going? Oh, yeah. Where are you going? So who, once again, who's gone Thursday? Two. Two? Oh, yeah, no mind. Watch this Thursday. Just this Thursday? Yeah. No, we're good. We're good in here. For Wednesday? <laughs> oh yeah, I just realized I'm going to be gone. Okay. Well, let's do it tomorrow, then. Get it out of the way. No, I have, like, a one period tomorrow. So I don't have any minutes. So there is a test tomorrow. So I'm not What? What? During TA in the comments. Well, there's going to you get to oh. Okay, let's vote. Vote for Wednesday. I just want you to move it quick. Vote for Wednesday. Hands up. Okay, vote for Thursday. Oh, it's Wednesday. All right. Good enough. They're just right there. Four problems. Four problems. It's going to probably take you, it might take you two days anyway. Why are you doing this? Why are you Okay. Yeah. That works. Uh, that won't be a good time.